Coffee with Caregivers production costs are covered by a partnership with United Healthcare and the National Foster Parent Association. We receive no federal or state funding and depend on our constituents and viewers to help us achieve our goals to provide support and services that meet identified needs within our mission. We would like to welcome the viewers of Coffee with Caregivers to the family. The National Foster Parent Association offers several membership opportunities for individuals, child placing agencies, and state and local affiliates. You can join today or donate at nfpaonline.org. Well, welcome to another Tuesday morning episode of Coffee with Caregivers. I hope the day finds you well and with joy in your heart. Um, we uh, here, I'm, I, if you all, most, most of y'all know I live in Central Texas and we've recovered from um, incredibly cold weather, uh, weather we haven't experienced in like a hundred years according to the historians and um, things are getting back to normal with some folks still having issues with uh, electricity and water. Um, but we're blessed here where we live and um, all that's working for us. And I hope it, it is gets better for everybody, not only in Texas, but all through the South that um, really experienced extreme cold and um, for long periods of time, which we're just not used to. Um, it just seems like, Every time I turn around, something else is happening that's not fun, right? Not a pleasure. Um, that is troubling. It takes consumes a lot of time and energy, um, and a lot of emotional energy as well. Uh, and so, you know, I just wanted to recognize for everybody that um, if we can face each day with a smile on our face and and help others experience that that you can make the world better as you, as you meet folks um, uh, during the day to day um, by giving them a smile or saying a kind word, um, because we never know, you know, who needs that and how much it can mean. We can actually be saving somebody's life. And I guess why that's on my heart this morning is um, been working with a, um, a producer of a, national documentary on suicide um, that's that's currently in production. And um, so we've provided some video uh, content for them and um, not sure how much will actually make it into the documentary, but about the National Foster Parent Association and the resources that we have available, um, materials that we have available, websites that are available, um, and uh, our work with the various states through our Council of State Affiliates to help um, hopefully help people who uh, are in need or might be experiencing uh, suicide in some form or fashion. Uh, the documentary is going to focus on youth in foster care, their caregivers and their families, and veterans. Um, so it's a kind of a um, small group in the scheme of everybody in the world, you know, in the United States, um, but certainly significant in what the data is showing about the number of kids, even younger, like eight, and nine years old, uh, committing suicide. And some of those have been kids in foster care. And certainly the number of teens, that's gone up as well. And also young adults who have been in the system and are out on their own and oftentimes don't have, um, a relationship that's meaningful to them with an adult that they can count on. Um, but even in times when they do, and for all of us with our, our families, our children, our grandchildren, uh, this is a really difficult time in, in, our, in our history. And we need to be paying attention to, um, with lots of observation and listening um, very closely to what's going on with our families, um, with our neighbors, um, with our relatives, 
um, because this is becoming an epidemic in itself. And um, um, as I was writing my script, so to speak, for the, the video uh, for the producer of this documentary, it really made me think through some of the things that um, the calls that we've been getting um, about help and how we um, probably can do some more things uh, to beef up uh, the assistance and the information that we have available um, for situations like this. So it's a tough topic, but um, it's one that um, we need to talk about sometimes just because it's so relevant during this time with the pandemic and kids not going to school and not having their friends and the outlets that are really important to their development. Um, so I want to um, show you my cup for today. And it says, uh, I always have a hard time, love makes this house a home. And of course, the love in that house doesn't come from the brick and mortar, the plywood, right? It comes from the people who live in that house. It comes from the families. Families can heal and families can hurt. And we always want to be on the healing side of that, right? I chose that cup today because of who our guest is. <coughs> Excuse me. Our guest is uh, Howard Glasser. There he is. So Howard is um, somebody that I was able, I had the privilege actually to listen to, give a, a speech many years ago. We, I was telling him, I can't even remember where it was, what the function was, but it was so impactful that all these years later, as I was looking to see who, you know, am I going to ask to be some of my guests this year on Coffee with Caregivers? Howard's name jumped to my mind and um, I had to Google him and try to find out is he still even doing what he was doing back then, you know, uh, thank God you are Howard. Uh, and I'm going to let Howard tell you a lot about himself because I think he's an incredibly interesting man uh, with a very interesting uh, past. And, um, but I want to tell you that on his website, um, you need to go on there and read his um his uh, living biography. What a wonderful idea. But on there, there's a quote by Patch Adams. And I know a lot of y'all have probably seen the movie, right? And maybe more than once. I've, it's one of my favorite. I've watched it numerous times in, over the years. And uh, so Patch, this very renowned physician, and this is the quote from Patch. This is the approach that I recommend. Okay. So what approach are we talking about? We're talking about something called nurtured heart approach and that's what howard's going to talk to us about today kind of where it came from how he developed it what the process was and just what does that mean and how is it different than we were ourselves parented and probably how we parented our kids so um howard i am so excited to introduce you to our viewers hi irene it's a pleasure to be here Thank you. Um, and and I, I hadn't even thought of that living biography for the longest time. I need to go reread it because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I know it's, it's, it's got many sides to it. And, and um, I'll probably hiccup a few times when I read it. Uh, but uh, by way of a, um, a really inspiring person, David Wagner, um, uh, I was urged to uh, create one instead of my ever more concise little professional biography, which is limited, you know, maybe has one sentence of, of really being alive um, as opposed to a whole document. Um, yeah, can I share my cup? My, Absolutely, my, please do. Somebody made this for me, my friend Jan Hunter. Uh, nurture your heart. I love it. And I am so appreciative to have this 
uh, to draw upon for this beautiful occasion. Um, you know, I'm not, um, you, you, to, to answer your question, I wasn't planning a, on, on creating an approach. Um, I, I did study psychology a long time ago. Um, I did an internship with the people who began the work called milieu therapy, if that still even exists. You know, um, there, there were six articles in the field in 1974 when I happened <laughs> upon them. Three were written by um, a, a psychiatrist in England and three were written by uh, a psychiatrist in New York. And I got to work with both of them. And, and I thought that was going to be my career. And, I, and that's certainly what I plan on doing my dissertation on. Um, and I wound up taking off what I thought would be a year to just get my ducks in a row and um, keep driving cab in New York City to earn you know, earn my way through school, pay my way through school. And, um, and, and I thought I would do some, uh, my, live my childhood dream of woodworking for, you know, uh, just that year um, to just get that out of my system. And, and one year turned into 15. It was way too long a, a gap to be able to recover my academic uh, standing and to pick up where I left off. And, uh, the important part of that story is that gap played a big role in, in when I did dust myself off and start a family and decide, you know, I've had it with sawdust and fumes. Um, I found my way, I was living in Tucson then, and I found my way to a child family clinic. And um, I was eager to actually, you know, work with families. You know, I was, I, I thought that would be exciting and i certainly had studied with some really interesting people you know back when i was uh doing internships and residencies in my field if i was studying carl rogers or anybody else you know i i i i didn't have the audacity to be anything but loyal to that approach that you know whatever approach i was studying was what i was I was expected by my supervisors to be faithful to. Uh, but when I got out into the real world, trying to help real families, um, that fell away very quickly. You know, when I noticed, yeah, maybe it worked for Carl Rogers, but it wasn't working for me. Maybe what so-and-so somewhere else, some other approach, you know, and I probably blew through 10 or 15 approaches in a matter of a month or two. Um, when it not only seemed to not be working, but I kept, I had a nagging feeling that my advice was making things worse. And I started to appreciate people who were coming for help with their difficult kids were, re had already tried everything they could think of. <laughs> they had already read some books. They had already gotten advice from, you know, neighbors, relatives, uh, professionals. And, and, you know, at some point, it's going to sound like a Seinfeld episode. I had nothing. At some point, you know, I had, I had read everything I could get my hands on. I had asked people working in my office what they do. Nothing felt right to me. And nothing was showing itself to really be different. And, and in those stark moments when I had nothing, I noticed something that just kept jumping out of me, which was that uh, the adults in the room, the parents, sometimes would say something to a child that would draw them in, draw the child closer. You know, it was the connection they wanted all along, but sometimes often they were none the wiser. They didn't even know they were saying something meaningful. And, and sometimes they be clearly believing they were saying something meaningful and the child, was, the child couldn't get far enough away. There was an energy flowing between the um, members of the family 
that seem to be not only be relevant, but seem to take win, win the day. It seemed that energy was running the show. Mm-hmm. And I I became fascinated. I, I the way it worked for me, I wasn't planning on 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 developing an approach. I, I'm not the guy who was academically culling through all the research and trying to find my way to uh, you know what are the ten best techniques that I could thread together and 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 give a name to. Um, I, I really feel the approach developed me in in that I would wake up at at two three in the morning and I'd have some something would occur to me like a story a, a metaphoric way of explaining what I was seeing and. The way it worked for me is I'd go back in the office the next day and I would try it out. I, I would try to explain vis-a-vis the story to the family I was working with, you know, uh, you, um, what my observation was and what what that meant in terms of how to interact with their child. And I would often see, frequently see the aha, just kind of, almost do two things at once, shake them up a little, kind of create a hiccup, like, oh my goodness, I don't want to be that kind of person. I want to be this kind of person. You know, there was this moment of definition that these stories would engender. And, you know, it it was probably five years before I even came to giving it a name the nurtured heart approach. Yeah. You know, that was the furthest thing from my mind. You know, I, 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 all I was fascinated with was the family in front of me and trying to help. And, you know, as you know, and I, I've listened to a bunch of these interviews you've had, um, you know, the, the universe plays a role too, you know, in all this. It, it, it may have all the votes, ultimately. And, and mm-hmm. for the first two years, my referral source was um, pretty much just your average ADHD child. You know, uh, impulsive, hyperactive, inattentive, um, uh, sometimes aggressive behaviors, but the whole laundry list of what's called ADHD, you know, in Somewhere six months into this developing, it became pretty uh, humorous and exciting to me that the same intensity that was driving this family crazy in the beginning, you know, maybe a month or two into telling them about what I had to share, the same very same intensity that was a problem now became the source of a child's greatness. And and two years later, my referral source changed and I was starting to get the more difficult kids. I mean, the really more difficult kids, the kids, you know, from your work, the kids who were expensive to the system, the kids who were blowing out of placements, the kids who um, were stretching everybody's imagination and we were worried about them winding up in in out of home placements, you, you know that kid. So, so that was the next, you know, um, bunch of years of my career, which was I remained fascinated and I kept digging in and I kept wanting to. Okay, I know if I work this approach uh, diligently enough, that you know we'll get there. And and in in a lot of cases, maybe in most cases, we did. So I could pause there and and um, and. Let it be a conversation. Sorry for going on for so long. No, I think it's so interesting. You know, one of the things that I learned from your uh, living biography is um, that you described yourself as a very difficult kid for your parents to raise. And uh, I thought that was interesting uh, that, you know, you were able to identify your actions and and the maybe whys about that as you grew older and and were thinking through some of this and um, do you think that that your experiences with 
your difficultness and how your parents responded, which was probably just like all of us have responded to our kids, mm-hmm. had a, an impact on, mm-hmm. on how you approached this maybe just because you had that in the back of your mind the whole time about, you know, why was I doing what I was doing and what did I need in order to, to, to do, not do that anymore or be better? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'm just curious. It, it's a little, uh, actually, I, I may give you a surprising aspect of that. Um, yes, it did inform parts of my journey, but I think the part that may be a little heartbreaking for, for all us to hear was it, it um, even, uh, even into my adulthood, uh, there was so much disrepair in my childhood uh, relationships with my mom and dad that, um, <clears throat> that uh, we never really got back. It's not a happy ending the way Whoa. you would think it would be a happy ending. Um, that even though my parents were alive when I wrote my first book and they were certainly happy about that, they had made me, I was a good kid, just stuck in an awful um, pattern of life. And they were trying to be good parents um, with what they knew, but what they knew was making me miserable and act. And I was so irreverent and I was so uh, determined to, um, the only way I was keep, I could get relationship was through my negativity, uh, at the time. And, and, you know, I think what keeps me passionate, um, even into my elder years now is, is the loss of relationship. Is it's not something we could take for granted. It's not a given, and um, that's why I revere people who dug in and and changed. They they didn't know how to change, and I didn't know how to advise them at the time to change. Right. It wasn't my place. Um, so I I feel I, I I saw that register with you. You know, for me yeah. it was a, it's a loss. Um, so I don't assume anything when I meet a new family <clears throat> and, and I, I'm, I'm just, um, over the moon for all the families who stay open despite the challenges that, you know, especially in the foster care world. Um, uh, yeah. you know, I don't think people are really told what to expect, um, I, th- I think personally, having met so many foster parents uh, and, and adopted parents over the years, that it's a given that child is going to be challenging. You know, by one manner or another, that child's had uh, had had uh, adults in their life, even if it's you know losing their, their parents in a car accident, uh, and it had nothing to do with trauma, you know, of uh, like abuse kind mm-hmm. of trauma. Um, that in their minds, that adult has dropped the ball. And and they have to, you know, I think, understandably, bat the ball out of, see if they could bat the ball out of the next person's hands. You know, oh, yeah, really? You got me? Oh, yeah, really? You love me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, really? You can handle me? You know, and I, I think the only way a child has to determine that is to act out. So it's almost a given. And I don't think enough people are told that when they, right. when they, sign up and um you know it, you know for better or worse a, a lot of people in in um the foster care world have found my work because they're looking for answers and i'm so excited when somebody is actually you know a i don't i don't think ordinary parenting always does the thing uh, it, it it doesn't you know, normal traditional parenting could be energetically upside down. Uh, Let me give you one example and then I'll turn Mm -hmm. it back to you. Mm -hmm. Is is like, we all want kids to be respectful. We all want kids to be responsible. And when do kids mostly hear about, you know, if if all a parent has is normal traditional approaches, you know, when a child is being respectful, or is being responsible, we have some pretty 
sparse ways of interacting and saying, thank you, good job, way to go, wonderful. It's right. loving, it's kind. I'm not going to ever question that. But when a child is disrespectful or irresponsible, <laughs> their child, you know, if parents say they're busy, they're never too busy for a problem. They don't right. only show yeah. up, they show up, they lean in, they get excited, they get emotional, they have so much to say. That's when we become poets. And 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 um some kids just innocently pick up an energetic impression that my parents love me more when I'm disrespectful because that's when they that's that's when they seem to care the most. They'll give me 10, 20 minutes of their time as opposed to two seconds um, saying good job. And and kids are measuring us in different ways than we suspect. And I'm not saying they're out to get us or make us miserable. It's just that it's a, a compelling force. And yeah. Um, you know, I agree. Please. And that brought back such, when I read some of what, again, what you wrote, it brought back memories of we had our first, first children that joined our family through foster care. And this was back in, oh my goodness, probably, I think, January of 1975. Two little boys, 10 months old, and um, Jesse was between two and a half and three. And, um, had come from a, a home with a lot of physical abuse. So they'd experienced a lot of physical abuse. And the, the baby had his, his issues of, you know, he'd, he'd cry and cry and cry and want you to pick him up and you'd pick him up. And the minute you got him up, he'd push and push and push and push and push and push to put him back down. He was so conflicted. He needed the, the connection, but he, couldn't take the connection. It was, and he was only 10 months old, but he weighed 40 pounds too at 10 months. And they had only fed him iced tea with sugar, lots of sugar in it. Uh, and he was just pudgy, you know, just like a dough ball. Um, his brother um, was doing everything he could. He destroyed everything he could reach in our home. I mean, literally broke everything he could reach. And um, so even before he was three, um, he was starting with a, a therapist because his behaviors were so um, kind of bizarre for a child that age. Uh, he was smart as a whip because he could think of all kinds of stuff to do, you know, that I don't know how I ever even thought to go break that or go find, you know, whatever. But the therapist said to, to me one day, she said, Irene, you know, uh, the stuff he's, uh, he's done, are, uh, they're amazing things. This, this is until, you know, this kid's got some intellect about him. And um, so she said, you know, you just got to hold out a little bit longer because every time he'd break something or destroy something, he would look up at me with this angel face and say, you hit me now? You hit mm. me now? Mm -hmm. And it's like she said to him, love equaled hitting. Connection for him was being hurt. That's all he knew. He didn't yeah. know the it's nurturing like part midi. of anything. Exactly. It's right. like a mini patterning, a mini patterning, a pre-patterning for domestic yes. violence. Is yes. People learn to create a fuss so that they can get the love fest that follows. And right. So no matter and, and, what we it, did, you know, let's hold him on our lap, read him a book, play ball with him. Yeah. or what, He didn't, that meant nothing. Um, yeah. and, and the therapist said to me one day, she's Irene, you know, I think, I think y'all have waited him out. I think he's about, he's about to have a come to Jesus time, event, she said. And um, she said, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I don't think it's going to take long. And he's going to do something that's worse than anything he's done already. And when you don't hit him, that's, he's going to finally have a realization, even at his very young age. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's hope it's soon. Right. And, um, two weeks later, he took me by the hand and he led me into my bedroom. He pulled out my lingerie drawer that was in my, my dresser. And he whipped out his little penis and just peed all over my clean underwear. And he looked up at me. He said, "Now you hit me." 
Yeah. Said, no, it's Jesse. like he had to throw you the kitchen sink to see, you know, yes, you held right. out, but, uh, but I gotta, I, you know what? I, I so deeply believe that I get connected through negativity that I got, uh, you know, I always got the next thing up my sleeve, so yep. to speak. And, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, the, the darndest thing is there's no way, there's almost no way out in the normal paradigm. And, and I can imagine how frustrated you were and how you had held out for so long. And, <laughs> and I, Goodness knows you might have thrown in the towel then. Um, well, you know, uh, and we were novices. We'd never fostered before. We didn't know right. what we were doing, right? You know, we right. had our training, and but it didn't prepare us for a beautiful little child like that having those kind of behaviors. Um, but when he did that, I said, no, I'm not. Jesse, I, told, I do not hit children. I'm not going to hit you. I'm not going to show you any, that kind of... Um, that that's I'm the kind of that kind of mama. It's not going to happen, and neither is daddy. So you know what we're going to do is we're going to go get the laundry basket, and you're going to help me put these wet clothes in there, and then we're going to go put them in the in the washing machine. And yeah. once they're dry, you you can help me put them away. And that's the process we used. But we were together the whole time, and um, you know the con the connection started. This. This man that I'm talking about it today is 49 years old, I think, about, about that, because my see his brother is 46. So, yeah, about 49 years old. And we still visit with him and his family. And, um, uh, you know, and he, he'll, he's told his children and now some of his, he's got grandchildren. Uh, boy, you know, you know y'all just don't know what I kinds of stuff I pulled when I was two and a half and three years old. And oh, this is, goodness. this is the lady who, who never hit me. She, she would not do anything to hurt me. And I peed mm -hmm. all over her underwear and she still didn't hurt me. I mean, he's told them that story. And so when we get together with him, usually with, with, with his brother as well, uh, and his family, uh, it's like, you know, they think back to that, those times and uh, the difference in in the the parenting styles that the the parents yeah. had, and of course they they had the the really se pretty severe physical neglect uh, abuse, but not just neglect but abuse. So their background was was different, but um, you know I I saw that before my eyes, and I never connected it to what I heard you say the first time I heard you speak really until you spoke. And I kept thinking, what was the, what was the, what happened when he did that, that it just seemed like from that time on, he wanted to be closer to me. He wanted, he mm -hmm. asked me to, to read him a story, which he'd never done before. And it was that, I think that connectedness that we had between the event <laughs> of him wetting on my stuff to washing them, cleaning, folding yeah. them, putting them away, being together, talking about things and just not, not being angry with him, I, I showing think, him attention I, because he was helping. I think that's what I would call transformational change. Um, um, I, I think people grow tired of improvement. You know, if, you know, um, I'm not, you know, I, I've seen so much change happen without the use of medication. You know, um, you know, uh, so many people because the medical world is limited um, in, in perspective wind up on medication. But everybody knows who's had a kid on medication that before the meds kick in or after it wears off, there's we're back to square one. The problems mm -hmm. that were there are still the same problems. So, so there's been no real healing, what people really want is transformation. And I think, I think um, there's a way, what, hopefully what I do contributes to fast tracking that so pe people don't have to go through what you went through. What I look for is, is the many, many moments when the child is not doing the problem. So, um, you know, when right. the child is not creating havoc when the child whatever you want to call it when the child's not breaking things 
that's when I want to approach the child and say, Jesse, you're not breaking things right now. And that shows me, I want you to know what that shows me. That shows me your respect. That shows me your kindness. That shows me your wisdom. That shows me your power. You know, he's three years old or less than three years old. Of course, I would temper the language to dial it in. But I wanted your listeners to know that that we could get ahead of the curve by taking advantage of the times when, you know, instead of waiting for the problems to happen and and holding on for, you know, uh, you know, white knuckling it while, you know, waiting for the problems to happen, we can get ahead of the problems and go upstream and take advantage of the many, many moments during a day when the problems aren't happening. And then, you know, we, we, we hold the child, we credit the child for, for when things go wrong. You know, I'm an advocate for crediting a child when the things aren't going wrong. You know, what credit can we say without it sounding like malarkey? You know, what, wh- without it sounding like, you know, kids can see through to, uh, to lies and, and, and mm-hmm. BS, you know, for lack yeah. of a better term. So, yeah. so what, why can we be thoroughly genuine and honest and real at the same time play hardball with the truth and say, you look like you were going to yell and scream, but you didn't. That shows me your self-control. That shows me that you care about our family. That shows me that you were being respectful to your sister. And, um, and uh, whatever we want to say, we could pour into those moments. Right. You know, um, one of the uh, uh, excerpt of what I read on your on your website, it's you said that in your experience, the most intense kids are often the best and brightest kids on the planet with mm-hmm. the right strategies. They get to be not the bad kid or even the good kid, but the great kid with great things to contribute. I mean. I love it. I I love that because it really does look at the future and the potential and makes them think about a different way of doing things, a better life for themselves later on. Um, And uh, so I I just, I'm so happy that um, you are on with us today and, um, and uh, maybe we can do it again. Um, yeah. In a few months or something, right? I'd love yeah, to I do that. Have another cup. That would be interesting. Oh, okay. Well, let's 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 make a plan for that. But I think our time looks to me like it, we're we're maybe even a little over time. So, uh, um, I just want to thank you again for sharing, um, you know, some of your past and um, thank you. how it's led you to the great work that you do. Uh, I'd be remiss not to say that not only did you write your first book, but I believe you've written 15, maybe? Yeah, right? something 15? like that. So um, uh, our audience can uh, take a look. Uh, please go go uh, Google Howard Glasser, Nurtured Heart Approach, and um, learn and, um, and see what you can do about, you know, finding um, some training by Howard or people that he's trained who use that approach and their practices. And I know they're all around the country. And um, in fact, one of our guests that was on not long ago, Kim Combs is one of your mm-hmm. protégés, I believe. Right. And he just yes, speaks he so is. highly of you. And um, he absolutely believes in the nurtured heart approach. And uh, it was um, so good to talk to him. And I had mentioned that, uh, you had agreed to be on an episode and he was so excited about that. <laughs> so anyway, um, I think it's time for us to, to say goodbye. And um, uh, again, very much appreciate it. And we will talk with I'm you honored, again. Irene. Okay. Thank you. All right. It's been a pleasure. All right. Bye-bye everybody. This episode is brought to you in partnership with our friends at United Healthcare. For more information about United Healthcare, please visit www.uhc.com.